And so I'm going to give you, in, as we begin to conclude here, and I think I'm okay on time, I just cheated and looked at my watch, so I want to just give you a few thoughts. In 1784, well, and I should point this out, obviously peace to come, the army will begin to be furloughed, they begin to break up the army in May because they're still concerned something could go wrong. The army isn't paid right away. The soldiers who marched away were given script. Here's your promise of 100 acres of land in the future. We'll let you keep your musket. What did they do? They sold all of that stuff quickly so they'd get some square meals as they were headed home or wherever they were going after the war. So that will all work out. There'll be a final peace settlement in September 1783. So the peace did come. The army will be fundamentally disbanded. And Thomas Jefferson wrote this in 1784 in referencing the Newburgh crisis. And I quote Jefferson, that the moderation and virtue of a single character has probably prevented this revolution from being closed as most others have been by the subversion of that liberty it was intended to establish. Quote, unquote. It's an amazing quote. By the way, in case you're interested, that is in the context of a letter I hope you're ready for this, in which Jefferson is complaining to Washington about the society of the Cincinnati. <laughs> He's trying to say, well, you don't want to be a part of those aristocrats. You know, that was the great charge at the time. So I thought, it's a little irony there I thought I'd share with you. Well, here's another one who had good things to say about George Washington. His name happened to be George III. At one point, there are two of these quotes. I'll just give you one of them. He was involved in a painting session with Benjamin West, and he started to talk about Washington, West did. And, and, and the, the king said, well, what do you think about this guy? You think he's going to lay down his sword and go home? You think he really means that? That he isn't going to grab all power for himself? And West said he thought that would be the case. And George III supposedly said, according to the sources, if Washington does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. There you go. That's an endorsement from the King of England. I find that fairly impressive myself. Okay. So what I can tell you is Washington will lay down the sword. December 23rd of 1783, in Annapolis, Maryland, he will not lay down the sword officially. He'll turn his commission. And he said, I do this respecting our dearest country, and I hand it to the protection of Almighty God, that is, the country. Having now finished the work assigned me, I retire from the great theater of action and bidding farewell to this body under whose orders I have so long acted, I have so long submitted myself, what? To civilian authority the key to any successful republic. I here offer my commission, I return my commission, take my leave in employments of public life. It's an amazing scene. He arrived home at Mount Vernon on Christmas Eve, 1783. As I've studied Washington's life, what I found is a man of enormous intelligence. John Adams once said he didn't think Washington was very smart. Washington didn't go to Harvard. He didn't have those advantages. But he did read, and that's one of the things I learned last year when I was a fellow at Mount Vernon, the new presidential library. Washington was attached to Roman history. He was fascinated by Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus, who back in 450, or 480, yeah, 458 BC laid down the plow, went into the field, for six months was named dictator, defeated the enemy, went home, laid down the sword, and went back to the plow. That is imagery that is embedded in Washington. Another one of his favorites, he loved this play, Cato the Younger, a Roman senator who stood up to the tyranny of Julius Caesar. Now, if you know the real Cato, he was nothing special himself, but it's, it worked in the play. But there's a line in there, in Cato a Tragedy, 
uh, this play that was written back in the early 18th century by Joseph Addison. Washington loved this. He quoted some of this in letters. There's a line that was his favorite, and I share it with you. A day, an hour of virtuous liberty is worth a whole eternity of bondage. A favorite line. It is an incredible story about George Washington. This was a person who understood what the cause was all about. This was a person who persevered to the end. This was a person who gave him himself over and over and gave us, the American people, a successful revolution. That can, from my point of view, be the absolute greatest of gifts. Let me give you some names because this will be part of my book. Have you ever heard of Napoleon? Have you ever heard of Lenin? Have you ever heard of Stalin? Have you ever heard of Castro? Have you ever heard of Mao Zedong? They all claim to be liberators, but millions upon millions of people died under their oppression in the name of liberating people. So I'll put George Washington up against this group of thugs any time. And you got a quote for that right there. And some of my colleagues aren't going to like that, but that's too bad. Because that is the reality. Let me give you, we debate, we academics, whether this was an exceptional revolution. Well, what have I just described to you? Exceptional behavior where one person was able to keep and bring so many others back to a sense of what their they were really all about how they should be giving citizens and contributing citizens. And in the process, he helped to mold and shape this republic, a republic which is, as it's been said, dedicated to liberty, a republic which keeps trying to define what that term means. But by golly, it's very good to be defining it and redefining it from my point of view, because we are a blessed people, largely because of leaders like George Washington. And I thank you.